fiction, science fiction, horror, fantasy, crime, LGBT, thriller. You have now entered the house of mystery. With your hosts, Eric Shapiro, David North Martino, John Copenhaver, and Al Warren. Heard on FM Los Angeles. 102.3 FM Riverside. And 1050 AM Palm Springs. Oh, welcome back into the house of mystery. I'm Al Warren, Mr. Michael Hawley. It's Wicked Wednesday. That is correct. Hey, Al, I just found out a limitation to technology. No the uh, the good news is, is the Whitechapel Society has asked me to... Uh, do a lecture for them in June on my research on Tumbledee. And then, uh, but I'm all excited about, oh, yes, I'm going to London. And then they go, so Zoom. Yeah. <laughs> so they're going to do a Zoom thing. Okay, I will do that. <laughs> yeah. No, the world's changed, you know, actually. And, and uh, you know, because they started, uh, they remember they shuttled everyone home during the COVID. And then uh, even now, I'm uh, like, I'm in Seattle maybe two times for the show. And, in L.A. once every year because most people are not even coming into the studios any, anymore. So oh, everyone's man. Zooming or Skyping or phoning now, yeah. and nobody nobody tours like they used to. So it's I just know. a changed world. Oh, well. <laughs> but, you know, you could always tell them that you don't have any long distance or Internet in in Buffalo, so right. you have and to I, travel. I'll say, hey, if you want signed copies, then you're going to have to bring me there. Yeah. <laughs> Show up at their doorstep. Well, <laughs> now we're speaking of uh, Jack the Ripper, and so anyway, we're today we've got an author on who's uh, done a lot of true crime. His newest book is called "Filthy Murders of Ye Old Rochester, Monroe County Homicide in the Era of Jack the Ripper." Uh, Michael Benson, thank you for being here. Thanks, guys. Thanks for having me. Nice speaking with you. Well, Michael, what do you want to know? Well, just where did it all begin? No, actually, well, for you, how did you get tra- ro- roped into this world of writing and true crime? I, I did not volunteer. I was volunteered into, into the business. When I was nine years old, uh, my babysitter and her friend from down the road were horribly murdered in a oh. Jack the Ripper type crime. They, oh, uh, wow. It was graduation. I, I lived on a dirt road in a rural area south of Rochester, New York. And they went swimming in the swimming hole behind my house and never came back. They were found a month later, horribly sexually mutilated with a knife, hearts missing, evidence of uh, cannibalism, and they never figured out who did it. So I grew up to be a true crime writer, not a coincidence. And I wrote a couple of books to learn how to do it. And then I went back to my hometown as a middle-aged man, teamed up with a private detective and the mom of one of the victims who was still alive, and uh, we found out some stuff and propelled the investigation in a startling new direction, as they say. And that became my book, The Devil at Genesee Junction, which Roman and Littlefield was nice enough to publish as a memoir rather than as a true crime book. For the first 200 pages, I'm nine years old. And after that, I, I did a lot of publicity in Rochester. It was a very popular book. And they asked me what I was going to do for an encore. And but with the same team, we went out and we worked on the, the double initial murders in Rochester, New York, the, the alphabet murders, they're sometimes called. And uh, that, that book became Nightmare in Rochester, at which time we started to work cold cases. And I got, uh, I got emotionally overwhelmed, I think, by dealing every day with, with family members who'd lost loved ones, who were desperate for solutions, who the police were no longer doing anything for, and so they were leaning on me. And I was also in touch with some real evil in a way that, that made me uncomfortable. So I decided, rather than ignoring crimes in Rochester and, and moving on to something else, I would just go back in time. So I'm writing in this book, in Filthy Murders, about murders in Rochester during the 1880s and 1890s era of Jack the Ripper. Uh, and I don't have to feel bad for anybody I don't have to get the willies over anything. And although the, the stories are pretty creepy, you know, nobody's going to call me up and say, as, as one suspect once did, 
<laughs> at which yeah. time I hung up on him. Good. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so anyway, it's, and, and there was there was there was there was mob overtones. I got I got scared is what happened. Yeah. And uh, so we're, we're writing about murders that took place long ago, in the era of uh, of Francis Tumblety. Oh, that's, I, my, that's, that's my that's that's my expertise. Why, <laughs> you know, the man had the best mustache in the history of mustaches. Oh, he by the way, of, the uh, you know that uh, pic photograph of him in the helmet. Yeah, that's not that's not him. Oh, oh. so uh, but oh. I've got I've got a lot. That was that's my latest research. So uh, I get to update you on a few things. <laughs> well, I talked about him a little bit because I, he's not my favorite Jack the Ripper suspect. You know, I'm a I'm a Kosminski guy, but he is certainly the most Rochesterian. Right. Yeah. You know, we, right. we, we 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 you know we have witnesses who remember him as a kid running around the Erie Canal. It was very big in Rochester back then. Oh um, yeah. It was the the primary thoroughfare. And as being kind of a perv, he was, uh, he sold pornography. I don't think it was that common in 1880. He, uh, and he, uh, was a, a snake oil salesman, basically. What he did in downtown Rochester, he worked in a, an abortion clinic, probably not a clinic, an office. Uh, but apparently he only swept up, but he picked up enough to pretend he was a doctor later on in life. See, you know more about him than I do. Right. Yeah. It wasn't really an abortion clinic. He had, he had a French, uh, uh, French doctor, they called it, and then they had an Indian herb doctor. But part they did of that. Venereal was, disease, too, right? They, they oh, yeah, it. correct. Yeah. But they, and exactly. And so, and it was, it was really not pornography. What happened is that French cures doctor, he had some pamphlets that were, were pretty, uh, risque. So he would be selling those. But what happened is Tumblr took advantage of that. And so when he went into the, to Canada, he did the same thing. So, right. uh, but, but he did get in trouble because they actually did consider it poor knock. So, Michael, what do you know about about Tumblety and the Lincoln assassination? Well, uh, I know a lot about it because what okay. happened was is uh, what happened was is actually in 1863 he was hanging out with John Wilkes Booth in Buffalo, New York. Nobody knows about that. Nobody knew about that back then. But in 1864, what happened was is John Wilkes Booth and his brothers were playing, performing, and Tumblety loved the performance. And what happened was is that uh, when Lincoln was uh, murdered, then when John Wilkes Booth, they kind of claimed there was a young man in Brooklyn that claimed that uh, Tumblety was connected to uh, uh, Harold, um, and they hired Harold. But what I found out, it wasn't Harold that he hired. It was actually his buddy that uh, looked very similar to uh, David Harold. And so that's why Tumblety could get out of it quite easily, because it wasn't David Harold. But what he didn't tell people is the year before he's hanging out with John Wilkes Booth in in Buffalo. Oh, wow. <laughs> but but Buffalo uh, but uh, Tumbley was an extreme narcissist. He could give a crap about any any kind of uh, causes, so he would not have been involved. But uh, right. but what I did find out is uh, that uh, I found thirty nine murders in America that I cannot eliminate him. And now Tumbley was actually a hermaphrodite. He had no penis. So if there is a woman that what. Was, yeah, yeah. If there was a woman that was murdered or outraged, as they called it, it would not have been him. So I'm thinking some of the the murders that you have seen, he could not have done. Although uh, in October 1883, there was a dismemberment at the Erie Canal that Tumbley was in the area. So, <laughs> so wow. So you know, I I have dealt with killers who were impotent, and the knife came out when they they couldn't complete it. But but then he lacked a penis. Yeah, well, it, it was the size of the tip of his thumb, and oh. so and so, and he had this can't he unsee had, that, and he had this passion <laughs> for anatomical organs, and so he got she got when he was in Canada, he was uh, one of his patients died of manslaughter, and that evening during the coroner's inquest, he stole, he tried to steal the organs from that person. <laughs> oh. Oh. So, so you don't need details. You don't need details on he was arrested during. The Whitechapel murders in yes. Whitechapel for being with a male sex worker. Uh, oh no! Well, what happened is he he was I charged. Had, with I gross had assumed indecency. that was normal sodomy, but apparently we got something else going on here. Oh, it's gross indecency, gross indecency, and indecent assault. Four cases, uh, but what it shows is he was in the area. He is. Yeah. Uh, he never had a wife. He he only had passion for young men, but it wasn't. He wasn't sadosexual. If he was a serial killer like John Wayne Gacy. It would have been anger retaliatory. So they, they arrested right, right. him. And one of the reasons is because there's uh, evidence that he actually had 
the uterus collection in London. <laughs> so wow. That's isn't, new stuff. Isn't that normal? Don't, don't <laughs> all, don't all men carry a I uterus collection around in their case? <laughs> you know, he had a lot of reason to be angry. Oh, um, oh yeah. Oh, yeah, for sure. So, oh, and a young man. Alone. And a young man uh, in 1881 in New Orleans said that Tumbledy said, uh, the, the problem with young men these days are cigarettes and streetwalkers. They should all be disemboweled. Oh. He said that before the Ripper murders. So then when I found all this, and then, uh, but that's why I was curious about your stuff, because I wanted to know more detail about uh, the stuff that you had found. The, uh, the, the murders that took place when I was nine clearly were uh, a knife as penis murders. But one, mm-hmm. of the, one of the victims you know, had, the, had her crotch removed. Three of the four wow. breasts had been removed. Um, but fairly typical sexual mutilation, sadly enough. Right. There's not that much you can, different things you can do. So no, no real signature. And plus there had been a, uh, a month of summertime decomposition, which didn't help wow. matters at all. But yeah. I found this, I, what, what we found when I was writing The Devil Jesse Junction is there were these family of brothers new to the neighborhood and they were all rapists. They had all been, been arrested for rape. Only one had been convicted. Uh, their dad, was, had died suspiciously soon after being caught raping his own granddaughter. So, I mean, just a completely depraved family. And one, the youngest, was impotent. Ooh. So I figure, you know, the boys go out, and they, they find these two girls in the swimming hole. What happened? And they, they decide to take turns raping them. What happens when it gets to be Keith's turn? You know, the knife comes out, and, and I'm fairly certain that that is what happened to them. And uh, the guy who we suspect was the killer, ended up being uh, sentenced to 75 years in prison in Texas for incest. And uh, like his dad, wow. he died soon after being caught raping his own granddaughter. Did you say there was cannibalism as well? Well, there there are parts missing. Oh, okay. And of course, the, the, for years, the primary suspect was Arthur Shawcross, oh. who had spoken about being a cannibal. Right. And at the time of those murders, was floating around upstate New York looking for places to fish. So that fits, too. Uh, state police, without giving us details, said that they had eliminated Shawcross. But we, we don't okay. know why. Anyway, let, let, let's talk about the new book. Well, well you yes, know, What do you I, say? I was going to say that, you know, you guys should both get into writing for tourism Rochester. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> I'm coming to Rochester. I was well, once asked, that. how can you have so many serial killers in one city? There were three serial killers working in one neighborhood once during the 1970s in Rochester, New York. And I said, well, it's clearly something in the Genesee River. Said, you know, <laughs> maybe maybe the, the, the water they put in the Jenny beer. Yeah, or, uh, yeah, Love Canal's close, you know. <laughs> that's that's right. can't You can't blame that anymore. Yeah. <laughs> None of them had second sets of teeth, so. Oh. 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 You know, I, I totally understand you, because in the sense of uh, writing older style murders, I do a lot of those from the 20s myself, and it's to get away, because when you do It's modern, relaxing, right? Yeah, because the modern ones, you're dealing with people alive, and, and you're dealing with... Uh, oh. You know, survivors desperate survivors and people, families. yes. Yeah, and it's, it's yeah, please, really, the, po- the police yeah. won't talk to me anymore. Please find out who killed my daughter. Yeah. You know, and I say, of course, I'll do everything I can. But what, you know, what can you yeah. do? I'm, no, it's, the, it's hard. It's emotional. Yeah. Very good at their jobs. If they can't find the answer, odds are very. The reason, the reason that we got someplace that the police didn't with the, uh, the, the Genesee Junction murders was because I was a local. I was little Michael Benson who grew up down at the end of the street, and everybody knew my mom. And people were telling me things that they would not have said to a cop in a million years. You know, (laughs) these guys raped me when I was 10. You know, and two weeks later, the girls disappeared. And they were 10 at the time, so the police didn't talk to them. They talked to the parents. Parents didn't know. No, it makes a big difference inside. So listen, um, the timing of when you're writing these murders for the, you know, for the area, not only is it old rochester but you're talking about the, the the time frame is there a style or this is a terrible way to put it but is there a style or a type of murder or behavior that was going on that that was being conducted by these murderers that was kind of in common with each other no i, I murder ran the gamut back then as well as today um the book contains everything from housewife murder during a home invasion which is a 
horrible, familiar, modern type crime to people drinking for three days and getting in a fight in a bar and somebody brings a brings a gun to, to the fist fight. Uh, we've got a brother who kills a brother after a lifetime of torment. Wow. Um, so so what I what I did find was that there's a there's a common way that people reacted to the murders that is very different from today. Uh, I guess it, people were lacking in in entertainment. <laughs> yeah. You know, you, you had to go down, <laughs> you had to go to downtown Rochester and go to the nickel shows uh, if you wanted entertainment. There's no radio. There's there's no TV. That the newspapers could not be drier. Uh, they don't even have photos yet. And if there's a juicy murder, people run around spreading the word like like the town crier. And that there's often. I don't know if it was the same one, but there, it was often a, a 12 or 13 year old girl who would just run up and down the streets of Rochester and say, murder on Hayward Avenue, murder on Hayward Avenue. And a crowd would gather at, at the murder scene and it, and it would stay for days. They'd watch the police, they'd watch the body be carried out. Once the trial started, the courtroom was packed, the halls outside the courtroom were packed, the streets outside the courthouse were packed. Just people wanting to be the first to know what, what happened that day. What they needed was a really good true crime writer back in 1888. Yeah. Everybody in Rochester would have bought the book. Like and the, and the, the police were different, too. Uh, I don't want to say that they were more corrupt, but they certainly had, they had the openings to be corrupt if they wanted to. Prisoners' rights were never thought of at all. And the main story in in filthy murders of Yale Rochester main suspect is kept isolated for weeks they put him in the women's prison which is empty there are no women prisoners in Rochester that year and they <laughs> kept him there by himself for weeks and uh yeah only around election time were there women prisoners um <laughs> <laughs> and, and and then they would send guys in there to be pals and you know the guy would say you know I really like to talk to a lawyer you know, I know a lawyer. He's the district attorney. You should talk to him. And the, yeah, that's uh... so without anybody representing them. And they would say, oh, they also in this case, they, they were saying, look, we got the goods on you. We don't care what you say. If you don't confess, you're going to hang. If you don't confess, you're going to hang. And it was repeated daily <laughs> yeah, until. Sure. And, and then when they asked him questions and he would come up blank, they would say things like, well, did you have to move the baby carriage? off of the cellar door and pull the ring to get the door open in order to get the body downstairs. And sure enough, when he eventually confesses, he says, I moved the baby carriage off the door. I used the ring to open the door. And then he's, he's in court six months later. And well, how did you know those details if, if you aren't the guy who did it? He says, well, I picked up details every time they asked a question. Yeah, I was just saying that uh, I just remember reading one. It wasn't Rochester, but it was the same thing where the the townsperson said, well, the person in jail, even if he didn't do it, let's kill him anyway. Let's hang him anyway, just so the real murderer knows me in business. <laughs> it was yeah. in the paper. <laughs> yeah. Oh, oh, yeah. I, 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 did, I wrote about a case once in which the killer was a pregnant woman, hmm. and they, they wanted to – execute her before she gave birth so that the baby wouldn't be born into that horrible situation. Wow. I mean, yeah. I mean, it's, uh, wow. The, yeah. the baby was allowed to be born and later was rumored to be adopted by Babe Ruth, but I don't think that's close. That's uh, <laughs> well, and they, they also had different, yeah, they did. The police had different attitudes and behaviors. Like you could, they could rough up their, their suspect as well. Like there was, oh, sure. you know, it wasn't like uh, it is now. And, and not only that, the evidence would have been way different, right? They didn't, they, uh, there wasn't even fingerprints then, were there? That's in, right. So That's right. right. Yeah. They couldn't tell if blood was human or not, even through a microscope. That, so, could, be the, that could be dog blood. Right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, so they really didn't have, because uh, I remember some of the other ones in the late 1800s and that, even uh, the Ripper ones, didn't they just wash down the crime scene? Sure. Exactly. They tried to get the body out as fast as they could so the public wouldn't see. And then, uh, and the, the biggest case was that Polly Nichols, where they, when they saw her, they, they had, they had her gone within minutes. And then they found out she was, uh, you know, uh, you know, her abdomen was cut deep at the mortuary, not at the crime scene. Yeah. One thing I noticed right away is that if, if a person had bullets in them, they didn't know where the bullet was because you can't just 
go up to an X-ray machine. Yeah, they, 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 would, they would probe for a while, and then they would say, well, we're going to have to leave it because we don't know where it is. And today, of course, the first thing they do is they would take an X-ray and know exactly where the bullet was to, to remove it. And bullet wounds that weren't in an extremity were almost always fatal because you just couldn't keep infection out. Even there was no FBI at the time either, so interjurisdictional communication right. was nothing. So serial right. killers would have a heyday. <laughs> yeah. So when you were doing research on these sort of stories and stuff, yes, how reliable do you think the um, even the police reports or uh, newspaper reporting was at the time? I guess you kind of have to take it with a grain of salt, right? I do, and I found one really scary example. It, it was a case in which a husband shot the wife. She was asleep in bed at the time, put one bullet in her head, but she survived. And she's starting to talk and she's babbling and they're asking her who did it. She says, I don't know. I just felt a terrible blow on the head. Your husband says that we had home invaders. Was it, was it a home invader? She says, I don't know. I didn't see any home invaders. Well, apparently an, an apprentice cub reporter, Jimmy Olsen type, decides that he is going to fake a story. And he claims to have snuck into this woman's room, the sick room, and he talked to her, and she gave him a statement, which he writes out, and it's long, and it agrees with everything her husband says. Well, the problem is, it runs in the newspaper, and the next day, she wakes up, she feels a little better, and she gives an actual statement, which is completely different from that. You know, my husband beat me up, and now I've got a bullet in my head. I'm pretty sure he did it, but no, I didn't see him do it. No, there weren't any home invaders. And we never, of course, we never hear from this reporter again. It's uh, fought red-handed, trying to fake a story. Really kind of threw the case for a, for a loop for a couple of days until they sorted out that she had never actually said those things. Yeah, there, it was so, it was... I don't know. I just when I go through old reports and stories, it's so it's less report style and a lot more feeling, you know, especially in the police reports. They really go by their their instinct more than evidence. Well, one thing I did think of one of the things that makes it easy to research murders from back then is that the reporting is very thorough. You know, there's no recording equipment. So, you know, any court or court hearing or a coroner's inquest there's eight stenographers working, and every paper's got their own transcript going. So in, in, in that sense, it, it's, uh, it's, it's an easy research, but it also it gives you little details into the, uh, into the way things are done that perhaps weren't always intended. We have a transcription of a, a conversation at, right around the time when the husband in the, in the, uh, the murder of the wife is being released because they don't have enough evidence to hold him. And there is a conversation that says, well, you should really go out and look for a tramp because there's a lot of tramps in the area and they're always trying to steal stuff and always trying to beg from the housewives when the husbands are away. It's probably one of them who did it, at which point you could feel the light bulb go on and they go out looking for tramps. They find three that are on a freight train, two are run away because they're athletic and one who's a little bit crippled can't get away, and he's the suspect. And it's this poor guy, Ed Deacons. He's 16 years old. He was almost beaten to death as an infant. He's got a caved-in chest. Uh, he's got a wonky eye, uh, which apparently gives people the creeps, but it's, it's just an injury he suffered before he remembers. He went to an orphanage for a few years, didn't know how many years, and then escaped when he was 10 and had been on his own ever since, trying to keep sexual predators away from him and uh, trying to survive. And he, had, he kind of walked funny because he was, he'd been beaten up and nobody ever says, Hey, is this guy physically capable of breaking into a woman's home, strangling her to death and throwing her down into the basement? And, and nobody ever does, nor does anybody say that maybe 16 years old is uh, a little bit young to be talking about capital crime, but uh, that doesn't seem to bother anybody either. Right. It's just it, 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 a little more opinionated, maybe of, well, he's just uh, street trash or whatever. Or he's Right. Uh, and if we're wrong, who cares? He's just a tramp. Right. Right. Yeah. No, you're not losing anything. He's just cluttering the road anyway. So now, the, now one of the funniest things about this story is that in every story that's written, there is mention of the stones. It's Ada Stone is the murder victim. 
Uh, her husband, uh, Alonzo, was the, was the first suspect. And they had really close friends, the Joneses, John and Isabella, and they were showbiz types. That the murder victim had sung in the opera, and she met her husband because he was in the chorus in an opera, and their friends were, were very intimate. They, they lived in one neighborhood, and then they mo both moved together to the new neighborhood where the, where the, uh, where the murder took place. And it's all very wink, wink, hush, hush at these four neighbors who are so intimate with one another and such close, close friends. And Rochester, and I'm sure the same thing would happen today because I know that town like the back of my hand. <laughs> they came to believe that these people's unhealthy and unwholesome lifestyles had something to do with why that woman was killed. And there's not a lick of evidence to support that any of them were other than monogamously married. Here was the, the big the big scandal was Isabella Jones once left the stone house with only one shoe. Oh, what could it possibly mean? Well, what it meant was it was summertime. Didn't have to go very far to get home. She was going to carry her shoes. And when she got home, she realized she only had one of them. But you know, to return to get the other shoe, oh, was, was the other wife home? So it, 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 they were distracted by imaginary uh, hanky-panky going on in that house. Which isn't to say that the husband wasn't guilty, because the husband usually is. You know, in most cases, the husband's the only person who cares enough about the woman to kill her. Uh, but in this case, when they may, when they arrest the husband immediately, there is an indignation meeting, a phrase I'd never run into before. Hmm. And that one of the top ministers in Rochester calls his congregation into his church and says, "We've got to we've got to march down there to the police station and demand that Alonzo Stone be released because a man of his character." could not do something so horrible. Obviously, it's the work of a tramp. And again, it, that reinforced in the, the police eye who, who they should be looking for. And they got the, the, the cripple kid as their suspect. So, and then they taught him how to confess over weeks. Oh, of course. That was part of it, uh, teaching them how to, uh, giving them the, the, the right information and then working them into a confession, right? But the, the second case in, in Filthy Murders it has some comic relief that, wouldn't be there if it had taken place three weeks ago. But it was a case in which this fellow is almost beheaded by a razor, like his head's hanging by a thread. And the murderer is running around going, he killed himself, he killed himself. It was the <laughs> worst, the worst uh, case of uh, shaving ever committed. Yeah. Anyway, but, but, but his, the killer and the victim in that case have the same wife. She's a bigamist. Really? Yeah, and she she starts out by claiming that the the killer she thought the killer was dead, and she married the new younger husband. And then the 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 original husband came back and got mad and killed the new husband. Um, it turned out that wasn't the case. She 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 knew that the first husband was around all the time. She just didn't feel too bad about marrying multiple people, and it was okay. She said because the the murderer whose name was Jacob Wolfschlager, uh, was also a bigamist. So it's all, it's all fair. <laughs> that's funny. And, and then, so the same preacher married everybody, which that's why they had a lie and say that they were all widows. So anyway, that, I, I thought that was, it was funny that there was this kind of nonchalant attitude towards divorce. Question the, uh, you know, the Erie Canal going through Rochester and the yeah. Buffalo. I know in Buffalo, it was just nasty, lots of, Lots of crime going on because of that. And do you think some of that, uh, I mean, it sounds like Rochester was the same way. Oh, yeah, absolutely. You know, I think a lot of Rochesterians today don't know that the Erie Canal once went right through downtown Rochester. The, oh. uh, the aqueduct that took the canal over the Genesee River has, was repurposed at first to be uh, a trestle for the Rochester subway and now is the uh, for Broad Street, where Broad Street crosses the river. But yeah, there was uh, the major thoroughfares were not streets. They were railroad tracks and the canal. Hmm. And bad eggs were, were coming in and out a lot because, uh, you know, you could stow away on a barge the same way you could stow away on a, on a, on a freight car and in, in, in the train. Well, they didn't but it is, it, it is interesting work. trying to figure out where places are when the streets really don't exist yet. You know, we, the, one of the one of the murders takes place in Shalott, spelled like Charlotte, North Carolina, but it's pronounced Shalott for reasons I'm not clear on. But it's the the part of Rochester now that's right on Lake Ontario, 
And back in the 1880s, it was a resort town, and you had to take the, the, the brand new electric streetcar to get there. And it was a place where rich people would go on weekends to play, and poor people would go to steal. So you had a, just a crime-ridden little area uh, right by where uh, the Genesee River emptied into Lake Ontario. What's interesting is I found uh, an interactive map for Rochester that shows modern-day Rochester, and it, you slide over and it puts the old uh, oh. 19th century one on there. Where did you and find it, that? Uh, I'll find it for you because I, I appreciate what, uh, where Tumblety had lived, uh, and it's actually his his uh, his nephew's son actually bought all that land and sold it off in 1910, and all those houses still exist today. And so I found those houses. Fantastic. I don't want to go to that area though. <laughs> but oh yeah, well yeah. Well, I have I have a middle area of knowledge because I lived in the city of Rochester for the the first few years of my life in the 1960s. And uh, so I, I, I know how things looked at during that era. It's almost halfway between the stories I'm writing and now. And I went back to Rochester, of course, while doing the book and tried to find things that were still the same for illustrations. Right, right. Like, it looked like Brown's Race is still there. The, uh, the major falls in downtown Rochester was used to, to grind flour. It was the Flower City, F-L-O-U-R, before it was the Flower City, F-L-O-W-E-R. Right, um, and it's so so that all is is still there, but uh, yeah, I mean the the first story in Filthy Murders is uh, in a part of the city that really had just been gridded out. The uh, they had marked out the the property lines and the streets were in place, but there weren't enough houses to prevent anybody from taking the B line from downtown to wherever you were going. Okay, you would just walk cross lots. How, how do you compare the murders? Uh, back then as to compare to what they are like now, like as in purpose meanings or reasons why people were murdering. Do you find it very similar to the same reasons today? Is it just greed, money, rape, or is there something different? Yes. No, I, I think that, I, I think that uh, crime psychologically has stayed very similar over the years. There were some crimes that didn't exist then because nobody had thought of them yet. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I mean, until until Charles Whitman shot up the University of Texas, you know, nobody thought of like going to a school and killing a bunch of people and calling that uh, you know your your legacy. A lot of you know a lot of things have happened since that have, that have opened up new categories of crime. But yeah, the, the the murders in this book are their anger, they are sex, their greed. I, I found. No evidence that anybody understands what a sociopath is. Like, I'm sure they exist. But the whole idea that a, a, a man can be wandering around without conscience and who won't feel bad when he does bad things hasn't occurred to them yet. They haven't met Michael yet. <laughs> <laughs> well, what happened, one of the things is Eleanor Elsheimer, under oath, she, she was the neighbor of Tumblety. She said that Francis, she would go downtown in the city at nighttime and Francis would be in a dark alley on this, and his hands to the wall, just quiet like this. So there, and this guy completely lacked remorse. So this guy, um, we know that he was there till 1898 when his brother died. So every about twice a year he would come to Rochester. So I wonder if he actually watched some of these things go on. <laughs> well, I, well, and I, it's, you may correct me if I'm wrong, but I, I don't think that there were any ripper crimes in Rochester during that era. You know, the, only, the only thing that I would see, yeah, right, exactly. And and that, actually, I attribute, if if he was the killer, he would not have done it in his family's hometown, but in uh, I have him in Buffalo. The uh -huh. only thing I noticed is in, in Erie Canal in October 1883 is there was a dismemberment of this woman, and then uh, we find some dismemberments. Uh, like uh, where there was a quack doctor in New York City in 1881 uh, that did it, and uh, the person they blamed that the girl went to uh, was not there, but closer to him was Tumblety's office. Oh. <laughs> and so they found her dismembered body with the head, but not the organs. So it's like if you're going to oh, hide the him. body... That's yeah, him. If you're going to find a, a height of body, you wouldn't leave the head there. That's what you identify. He, he keeps so, the guts. <laughs> I know it uh, every time. But uh, that that's the only reason why I 
connected that 1883 October one, but that could have been anybody. He was anyways. starting his collection of uteruses. That's, <laughs> that's right. That's right. Another, another thing I noticed was the queasiness of the press to discuss sex crime. The word, uh, the word yes, rape true. never, ever appears in daily family newspapers. That's right. Uh, what do they, they call it? Uh, criminal assault. If a woman is criminally assaulted, you're supposed to assume that she was raped. If she was unnaturally criminally assaulted, I guess we assumed that that's sodomy. The chapter read between the lines. And, and then, of course, we'll go on and on for three paragraphs about, oh, the fiend who did this. <laughs> and and I also so noticed that the term outrage. They would say, out, yeah, she, she, was, was she was outraged, yes. That was the and other she, term. She died fighting for her honor. <laughs> this big. Yes, yeah. This outrage. She was outraged. <laughs> outraged. Yes. I'm outraged all the time. Do you know, oh, well, that's, that's, you must be getting sore. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> uh, that's, no, I don't even feel it anymore. Oh, good. That's good. outrageous. So what was the, <laughs> was there any particular crime that sticks out as being the most unusual or weirdest one that you've ever kind of come across? You mean in my life? Well, uh, I, yeah, no, because that that would be. But in, in this book, yeah. I, th yeah. I, I think I think in the, the most stone, the stone murder, because it, it remains a mystery, it, and it's the first half of Filthy Murders is is one story, um, and it's about the the murder of Ada Stone, uh, and the in the showbiz family and the wink wink best friends, and the the crippled. Uh, tramp who gets accused of it but here you have um a woman who's killed in her home her her child is home with her there's a three-year-old son who's floating around and you now somebody comes into that house kills her there's an attempted outrage but she fought valiantly for her honor and the guy who is uh, you know eventually tried for this uh doesn't appear to really be able to handle himself physically at all like he, he's stuck on surviving and uh either the husband got away with it which is uh entirely possible or it was one of those other tramps who ran better and got away and, and he was the one who did it so but it, in terms of oddness it, it, it just the fact that it's a very modern type crime to have someone actually go into another person's house and kill them and they're a stranger that's uh, I mean, right. that, that is serial killer type stuff, which uh, they would have you know, had no idea how to do. They would have had no idea in 1966 when the girls were killed behind behind my house. Sheriff Skinner had no idea. Oh, that's another that's the thing I've noticed, and perhaps you'll you'll agree with me is that the thinking was that men who hated women must be gay. The yes. notion that the notion that you killed the gender that you're attracted to. Hadn't occurred yet. So, so they're, they're looking. They're looking for gay guys who kill women, um, and they they still were in 1966, which it was you know which was ridiculous. The, the notion that gay men hate women is is I mean, I'm, I'm not the most worldly fellow, but I, I, I certainly know that gay men and women get along just fine. They share the same desires and fears. And the, and the, the hairstylist. <laughs> yeah. 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 <laughs> well, sometimes they use that the term. They use the term "woman hater," right? And uh, so it was actually used for both misogynist and uh, uh, gay. It is um, right. exactly what they did. I remember that. Yes. So yeah, they're, they're thought of as being the same group. Well, yeah, but that was the mentality, and especially yeah. when you get into the '60s, because in the '50s, because. Um, McCarthyism and and um, it it became the theory that uh, um, you know homosexuals and blacks were part of the uh, pinko commie um, scheme, you right? Know, to take down America, so they're either they're right. being used or they're in on it, you know. So it it, it kind of lumps everybody into one negative category that you, it's okay to dis dislike them. You know what I mean? Uh, give them right. all the bad um, elements in life. Right, that's right. So what do you think at the, at, at the end of the, the book here? So when you yeah. finish the book and yeah. you've done all the research, it's out now published and stuff like that. Do you think um, going through all of the research and the timing and all that stuff, how do you think that's changed you as a writer and a person? It It, it, it helped me psychologically. Because it separated my own feelings, which are the opposite of sociopathic. Still feeling guilty for things I did when I was four. 
Um, <laughs> and it's, and it, and then the part of me that, that enjoys true crime, that is a true crime fan, it separated those two factions so that I, I, I had fun writing again, which was something that I thought I gave up when I quit writing about sports, which happened 20 years ago. Hmm. But I used to remember just, just staying up all night working on something and just saying, this is great. This is exactly what I want to do with my life. And I spent a bunch of years kind of being a little bit feverish over my writing. So writing about 1880 and then the way things used to be in a landscape that my inner archaeologist gets to peel away the layers of Rochester that have been put on top of this and to see how it used to be you know, long before my, my grandparents were born. It, it, it helped me. I think I, I, want to, I want to do it again. Don't be surprised if there's shallow graves of ye old Rochester in a year or so. <laughs> Yeah. Well, I mean, you learn a lot about yourself as well, I think, going through these things, um, because you're forced to deal with a lot of different, um, right. you know, behaviors and emotions and stuff like that. And you well, yeah, I mean, I started as a true crime uh, expert, you know, when I was nine years old. I learned about sex crimes before I learned about sex, which is still an order I'm trying to reverse in, in, in my <laughs> subconscious. <laughs> According to my wife, I did okay. Um <laughs> But it, it's kind of late in the game to really fix me. But uh, I, I think that uh, writing about uh, Jack the Ripper era and uh, sooty, a sooty world where, where every chimney's got black smoke belching out of it and people are dying at 27 of black lung. Uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a simpler time. And I have fun putting in little asides just to keep the modern audience knowing what's going on. Because over the years, I've learned how things changed. Well, and that's yeah. certainly an important part of writing something in the history is to, um, because as we get older and the young young people come up, they're they're much further away from it than we were. They don't have a connection right. to a lot of things we did. Uh, like, you know. But I remember was, supper and lunch being reversed. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, well, there's a lot of things you probably, you know, it's a lot of things I remember and, and Nowadays. I remember ash cans. I remember when the, the garbage men came through and then the ash man came through and with a different <laughs> truck. And some garbage cans had garbage and some had ashes from the coal burning stove. There was a milkman. Yeah, there was milk a milkman, man. yes. But you have to you, you have to kind of uh, make sure that that's emphasis in, in throughout the book, right, in a way. They've got to feel like they're there too, right? Oh, sure. You know? Well, I, 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 I love painting the picture. If, you're a, if you are a Rochesterian and, and you get the book, you get to go to the places, and you get to see how it looks now. That you know, all those streets that go under the railroad tracks now, and uh, used to go right over the railroad tracks. There weren't electric signals. You had a man stationed at every railroad crossing with a flag, and they worked all night. And if trains coming, they waved the flag, and the car would stop, or the horse-drawn carriage would stop. And uh, a lot, of, and the, the the railroad workers knew a lot of disreputable types. The police would go to the, the, the flag men at the, at the crossings for, first of all, observations of strange behavior, and also, who's in town? You know, you know all the tramps who are on the, the freight trains, so who's, who's around today? There you go. Okay, what, yeah, I'm sure with the, I guess taverns have remained the same. People are still more apt to get shot outside a bar than any place else on earth. So that, that, that's remained the same. Well, that's a good thing. <laughs> it's a good thing. Some, 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 you know, customs stay the same. That's good. <laughs> oh, yeah. You know, they're reminisce. And, and, and in 19, 1890 Rochester, Italians are really marginal, which is something I, I hadn't understood. They were, I guess a lot of them were canal workers, and a lot of them did not speak English, and they were thought of as... Is dirty and lesser yeah. by the non-Italian Rochesterians. Mm, of course, I I think it's just a it seems to be an ongoing process in the development oh, yes. of of America. You know these different uh, minorities. It's human coming, nature, I suppose. Know. Oh, totally. The newcomer, well, the newcomer yeah. gets looked down upon. Yeah, yeah, You're right, and right. So, you know it's usually always the same complaints and it's the same arguments that go over and over and over again, and just different. The faces change, but it's the same. It's all fun till someone gets hurt. <laughs> so, okay. He killed himself. He killed himself. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So let's talk about uh, the books available everywhere. Now, do you also have a website and you do social media for your fans? You know, readers? I'm, yeah, I'm hitchhiking on the 
information superhighway at author Michael Benson. You know, the at sign at at author Michael Benson, all one word in your search engine. Well, I think we'll get you to uh, my Facebook. I have my own page there. And you can always look me up on Amazon.com. I am. There's more than one Michael Benson. I'm the one with the white beard. You're the handsome one. That's what that's I'm that's to say. <laughs> He's the good-looking Michael Benson. Oh, there you go. This, not, this, not this the is other. Benson's giving me the big okay. Yeah. <laughs> that's how we got to go. In here. my imagination. So that yeah, and uh, please, and uh, or I think my email is in there. And drop me a line. Let me know what you think of the book. If you know of a juicy crime, let me know, and uh, I, I will certainly look into it. When I first brought this up, somebody said, "Yeah, you, you know about the, you know about that uh, the, the woman who was found in her basement over on the east side." Because no, I never heard about that. And look where we are now. I got like 120 pages out of that. Did you find so yeah, it? if you have any suggestions, criticisms, want to tell me I'm great, that's good too. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and uh, I'll be your friend. Oh, there you isn't that nice. Yeah, See? I'm, I'm, I'm just well, you're just too giving. You know, <laughs> just, I, I'll occasionally like your post. Oh my God! Don't know. Don't don't overdo. I'm going it. out on a limb. Now. <laughs> yeah, don't just, go that far. No guarantees, <laughs> but there might be that day where you're kind of bored. But but don't do politics because that'll get you kicked off my Facebook faster than anything. Oh yeah, people save that. Oh, for, so true. So true. Save, save that, that for, for the family. Some, yeah. yeah, save that for Thanksgiving go, dinner. Go, go get go get shot outside a bar. Yeah, save that for the bar. There you go. You'll be the next in, in Michael's next book. Yeah, there you go. Well, the book, Filthy Murders of Ye Old Rochester, Monroe County Homicide in an Era of Jack the Ripper. How about there. that cover? I mean, my daughter did that cover. I it's like great. it. Yeah, yeah, actually, it's good. Yeah. Uh, it's It looks very good. Um, let's stop. I'm looks... blessed with a talented family. Yeah, <laughs> you certainly are. So, well, there we go. Michael Benson, thank you hey, very thanks, much. thanks, guys. Nice speaking with you, Michael. Let's do it again. You've been listening to the House of Mystery radio show. To find out more about our guests, hosts, or shows, go to www.houseofmystery.com. show is over for now. Was it as good for you as it was for me? Yeah. Good night. This has been a production of Something Weird Media. I'll be back.